Three, pick it up. Thank you. 
Down here, pilot ready rooms.
Oh, it tells you how. See impact. Mm. Engine failure, collision. Is there any ACs? These are all the ones that. Hey, if you see A slash C, that means a plane killed them. <laughs> well, look over here. MIG, it tells any you. aircraft. Yeah, look what happened. A slash C tells you. means they crashed. Well, the plane blew up and they weren't ready for it. C impact. C impact. Landing mishap. Well, this, well most of Vietnam. <laughs> Look, see they, look. What? Tells you what they, it tells you what they, which ones came from here and shot down what? From this ship. They all shot down me. Yeah, that was then. The Midway got three of them. Four, five, six. Look at this one over here. Satan's kitten. <laughs> Satan's kitten. Satan's kitten. Got a passenger. Roosevelt in the background.
the air boss on the left, the mini boss on the right. These gentlemen were generally commanders in rank. They had commanded tail hook squadrons flying off the carrier. Lots and lots of experience, so very much similar. The only real difference between the two is the air boss came on board first, followed a year or so later by the mini boss. He had to get some training. Once his training was completed, he'd get promoted, fleet up, take over for the air boss, would go on to a different assignment. Now, if they're doing uh, flight operations, they could be landing and launching aircraft for 12 hours or so at a time. They're going to launch aircraft off the front of the ship, the bow. There are two catapults up there. Catapults are going to take you and your aircraft from zero to about 160 miles an hour in two and a half seconds and 250 feet. You're going to be airborne for a while, depending upon whatever your mission was. When it got time for you to land in good weather, you're going to line up behind the ship about three quarters of a mile out. You're going to be going slightly slower, only about 150 miles an hour. And now you're going to try to set down in an area that would be equivalent to a tennis court. Three wires across the deck separated by 40 feet. Ideally, you wanted to grab the number two wire, which today our number two wire is right where that 301 on the aircraft is. It's Skyhawk. You're going to grab the wire there. They're going to roll forward and roll out 340 feet until they'll be stopped. Then they're going to roll back a little, release that wire, or yeah, release that wire, fold the wings, get out of dodge real quick. 45 seconds later, during the daytime, another aircraft touches down. The name of the game was to launch aircraft as quickly as possible, and the same thing with recovery. Now at nighttime, yes, it's much more dangerous. If you look out there in the four acres of flight deck and imagine the ship actually moving, uh, there's no cyclone fencing, very, very dangerous spot. So they increase the safety all the way out to a minute interval between aircraft. So not a lot of time, very dangerous place. There'd be about 200 sailors on the flight deck to facilitate landing and launching aircraft. Now, as far as up here goes, there'd be 10 to 12 people. We talked about these two, right where I'm standing in front of this box. This is called the Fresnel Lens Control Panel. What it did is it produces a visual glide slope for the pilots to use and to come on board. Basically, it tells them, too high, too low, right where you should be. Our Fresnel lens is right behind those blue garbage cans in the direction I'm pointing. We have a nice mock-up if you wanted to see all the different patterns. If you watched uh, Top Gun and other movies like that, from the pilot's perspective, they call that light the meatball. Now right next to it, this is the arresting gear monitor panel. Sailor operates this. He's going to get the mic and he's going to tell them the type of aircraft that's going to be coming down next. Then he's going to stare at the gauges until the tension in the wires is set for that weight of that aircraft. It's important that they all stop in that 340 feet, regardless of their size, because that's where the sailors are going to be to get them out of the way for the next landing. Now, what's that board all about? That's called a land launch status board, right there. And that's going to have information about the aircraft in the air, about to be in the air, things like who's the pilot, what type of aircraft are we talking about, What's the mission? What's the side number? So you could call it out from up here. And our air boss is over here. She's going to have a hard time reading it on that angle, right? So it's not going to be that way. It's actually going to swing out. It attaches here. A sailor maintains it from behind. The sailor is going to uh, write legibly. They're going to write quickly. And they have to learn how to write backwards. Five, six other jobs on board which required that skill. Most of these would be electronic today. And finally, in the very front of this space are six desks, upright desks, for squadron representatives, for the squadrons that are on the board. These guys are junior officers, and they really didn't have much of a job up here. They had a cool nickname. They were called Tower Flowers. Their value hmm. came when one of their aircraft in their squadron had an in-flight emergency. Then just as those people are doing, they're lifting the top up. And then underneath there, you'd find the emergency procedures. For that type of aircraft, they get their five minutes in limelight with the air boss as they try to resolve the problem by bringing them back on board or to land someplace else like over at North Island. Now our next stop, we're going to go down to the chart room. We'll talk about a little about navigation. As we go out here, uh, we're going to go down one ladder of stairs, hold on to the railings. Tall people, please watch your head. This ship. It's like, whoa, wow. <laughs> but they knew it was going out the next year to be decommissioned. Yeah. So welcome to the chart house, the home for the navigation department. That navigator had the responsibility to get the ship where it needed to be on a schedule. To land and launch aircraft, they need to have around 30 knots of wind across the deck. So during flight operations, they could be maneuvering a lot more than uh, they normally would. After flight operations conclude, they can get back on the schedule for the day. Now the sailors that worked in this area, they're called quartermasters. Quartermasters can maintain the equipment in here. They operated it. 
They maintained the charts, which could be reused, and they took the navigation measurements themselves. Let's talk charts for a moment. Let's chart over here on the right. Back on April 11th, 1992, way before many of you were around, basically in front of this ship across the way is where the ship would have been tied up and decommissioned. Then it got towed up north where it stayed for about 11 years, came back and started as a museum in 2004. We really can't get a better location than where we're at for a naval museum. Last year we had about 1.4 million visitors. So it's kind of always busy here. The chart underneath the plexiglass case over there, that would be Subic Bay in the Philippines. The ship was stationed in the Western Pacific a lot, so they could stop there for ship maintenance, resupply, and just some downtime for the sailors. One over here on the left is an important one. This is Yakuska, Japan. The Midway was the first U.S. aircraft carrier to be home ported outside of the U.S. Why was that important? Well, it's operating over there in that uh, area in the Western Pacific. Six to nine month cruise, when it's done, it has to transit the Pacific. That's a pretty big ocean, and that's a lot of downtime. Uh, so someone somewhere said, why don't you guys just stay over there? So they gave the Japanese a chance to maintain the ship. That worked out well. Sailors got to relocate their family next. That worked out better. They're in port more often. They have their family to visit with, nice country. Worked out so well, the Midway was there for the last 17 years. Today, the forward deployed aircraft carrier is the Ronald Reagan. Oh, yeah, the Ronald Reagan, but I thought you were talking about 71. No, 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 no. Over in Japan? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that would be Reagan. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little about navigation. We're tied up to a parking lot, right? Back in the day, it was an active Navy pier. We wanted to go from the Navy pier out to the open ocean. We could use a technique called piloting. Piloting, use a turn of the area you're operating in, like that one. On it, you're going to lay out a track. That's your path of intended course. Then you're going to look around outside for landmarks you can see with the unaided eye. Looking out that side, that'd be the left side of the ship. The port side, you could see the Coronado Bay Bridge. Looking out the starboard side, you could, can we see it today? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the uh, control tower at Lindbergh Field over there, the airport. Find a lot of landmarks. Then you're going to send quartermasters up to the wings of the bridge. They're going to use a little device called an alligator, like a little telescope. Sight in on those, call their bearings back to a quartermaster in front of a table like this. He's going to plot where three or more of those bearings intersect. You're usually going to find a tiny triangle. Your ship's position fix is inside the triangle, generally accurate to about 100 feet. Because there's lots of things to get in the way, you'll be doing those measurements every two minutes or so. A couple of common sense things you can't do with a ship, right? You can't bump into anything, right? Bumping into another little boat, you can see that. There's lots of radar things to help you, but bumping into the bottom of the bay here would be a, another problem. So either anytime you bump into something, it's a career limiting event. <laughs> so you're going to want to make sure that when you're in these enclosed waterways that this device here is going to be manned. It's called a fathometer. It measures the depth of the ocean below the bottom or keel of the ship. Why is that important? When you leave today, look at the uh, water line on the ship. The ship doesn't end there. As you can imagine, there's still today 29 and a half feet of ship going down. If it was f loaded for active duty with fuel and aircraft, etc., be about 35 feet. So real important, you know, this is manned. You stay on that track and everybody is cool. A few other things here are navigation techniques from the beginning of the ship's life in 1945. They had radar or uh, tra radar transmissions that would come on, radio transmissions that would come from the shore. They'd be able to intercept in here with uh, antennas, get their fix that way. Had names like Loran, uh, all the way up to the end of the 1980s. Look at that big box at the end of the counter. That box could handle the first versions of satellite navigation called transit. More importantly, that's how big GPS was way back when. It was accurate to 30 feet then. The one you have in your hand, your pocket's accurate <coughs> to about three feet. When you came in the doorway back there, there's an old device these Navy guys don't recognize. Uh, it's called a bunny tube. The bunny tube allows messages to be delivered up here to the real important people on the ship, like the navigator, the captain, like the, like the, the admiral, and there were five others. Dudes. So what you do is you put a message in a little container, vacuum, and it gets sucked up here right away. Just like you have at Costco or drive through bank teller. All right. Now the next item is, what is this big round cylinder all about? Anyone on take a guess? I've got need some more uh, wrong answers to add to my list. I've heard that it was our missile tube. It's our periscope tube. It's our exhaust tube. It's how we get little kids around the ship. That's how we get rid of our garbage. For Anyone water. want to add to my list? For water? Not water, no. What's the big pole that sticks up from the ship? 
<coughs> an antenna. What's the antennas on? I only got some antenna, bud. Right, so How about the there. mast of the ship? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty so That big pole is the mast, and uh, I pointed out it ends right here on this deck. You're all going to go look at it, and you're going to see that it's painted black. Why is it painted black? You came down the ladder there on the other side of the wall to the right is uh, the three large exhaust vents. This, unlike the Roosevelt across the way, which is nuclear, this is a diesel ship, and it would burn a little bit of diesel at half speed, 15 knots. It's going to consume at least 100,000 gallons a day. So imagine all that exhaust that's going to be out there. So if this pole up top was painted blue to match the sky, this sailor and 50 of his buddies are going to be maintaining it, what, 24-7 around the clock for their whole careers? I hate you from paint. <laughs> so it's painted black. It's going to get black. That's where the soot's going to adhere to, and that's why they do it. Also, the same idea with the bottom of the island. It's painted black. Aircraft back against it. Engines start up. Their exhausts are going to stick to something. Now let's go forward to the cool part of the ship, the bridge. Good. You can also go in the pilot house, just don't go down the passage. Yeah, right? Have you been on the bridge over there? Yeah. They had to call me up, but it was just because it was for good reasons. I got promoted. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but it's just so much more spacious than this. It is. It's a lot more spacious. The captain eats great. He has his own cook. Oh. You been on the Admiral's Bridge? <laughs> no. He's got a huge TV. Oh yeah. <laughs> they have, well, I used to work in the mess decks up on the uh, up in the bridge, and they had like flat screen TVs, and we're out in the middle of the ocean. They're kicked back, legs up, eating food, watching the TV out in the middle. Of the ocean. <laughs> Are you, you don't get that. <laughs> no, I don't get so, that. Oh, everyone, yeah. welcome to the uh, bridge. The navigation bridge is forward. The pilot house is in the back. This is where all the command and control came from to operate and navigate the ship. Today, we have an actual Navy sailor on board from the Roosevelt. He's in the CO's chair. CO stands for <laughs> Commanding Officer. He would have been one of about 40 different captains that sat in that chair. He'd be a little older, 46 to 48. <laughs> He'd be in command 12 to 18 months. It was a great place for him to be in command of this ship because 30 of those 40 captains went on to become admirals later on in there. And also, if he wasn't the captain, no one really would ever go near that seat because there was a high price to pay, right? Yeah, you don't touch the seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all the command and control, though, to run the ship didn't come directly from him. He got involved when he didn't like what was going on. There was a team up here called the Bridge Watch Team. The watch team was led by the officer of the deck. This was his general uh, operating area up here. He was assisted by two others, the junior officer of the deck, the junior officer of the watch. These guys were very busy and uh, very professional, and they did their job, and you didn't get in the way, or they'd run you over. They had lots of different jobs. Up forward here, we have surface search radar. They're going to be using that to see all the contacts that are around the ship. They'd be in contact with two lookouts that are overhead using binoculars. A lookout in the rear of the ship that's using binoculars to see if anybody fell overboard. They'd also be spending a lot of time looking at that board inside the pilot house that's called the skunk board for surface contacts unknown. The uh, sailor that maintains it is riding backwards. He's talking to the combat information center down below. Uh, the junior officer of the deck usually had a secondary job. He's called the conning officer. If you watch a lot of Navy movies over the years, you've probably heard someone say, I've got the con. What does that really mean? It sounds cool, especially in the submarine movies. What does it mean? It means that this woman right here, she's going to give that order to the guys in the back. She'd be the only one up here who could give orders with regard to changing the speed and direction of the ship. Why is that important? The ship's 1,001 feet long. It weighs 69,000 tons. It has 4,500 sailors on board. You only want one person to steer it. The guys in the back are early 20s, again, 45-ish up here, so if multiple senior officers up here are given orders, they might all get listened to back there. That's why they do that. So we're going to go in the back now in the pilot house. We'll talk about what they did as we do, as we go back there. When, and I can't remember who it was that ran into what they ran into, but it was a big naval ship and it ran into something. Yeah, that does, happens a little there bit more than you would think. Yeah. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. 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 So, that was the USS McCain. And McCain. And McCain yeah. So what happened there? I mean, you've got all these people. Yeah, well, we're, we're going <laughs> to give you a little <laughs> hit on that. <laughs> but the, the Midway also had collisions. Well, a guy fell asleep. Oh. Really? <laughs> on watch, yeah. Okay, come on back here, guys. Yeah, you always take your watches seriously. You can't fall so, asleep. 
This person right here, this is the, no. the helm. He's at the <laughs> steering wheel of the ship. He's, go ahead. He's at the helmsman. By turning the wheel here, he's changing the angle on two large rudders behind the ship. Eventually, we'll get on that course. He's steering based on the gauges in front of him. He doesn't need to look out the front or the side. This gentleman here, our Navy man, he's at the Lee Helm. This is the uh, area where he's going to be referred to as the person with his foot on the gas pedal on the ship. By moving this dial up here from one area to another, he's going to tell four engine rooms and 12 boilers that I want to go faster or slower by five knots. Uh, he's called the Lee Helmsman up here. Now let's put him over here. He's now the boatswain's mate of the watch. He's the senior enlisted guy up here in charge of these two. Make sure they respond accurately and quickly. He's also going to make uh, announcements shipwide on the 1MC over there, public address system. Also, by being security up here, you can tell he's not going to let anybody come up here that doesn't need to be up here. He was just mentioning before that he got called up here one time uh, uh, to, on the bridge on the Roosevelt. He got a promotion. But usually, if you get called up here and the captain's going to have words with you, it's probably going to go the other way, right? Chances are it's not good. I was shaking in my boots. <laughs> <laughs> now, he moves a little further. He's going to be in front of this desk here. He'd be the quartermaster of the watch. He'd be updating the chart in front of the navigator. And in the front of that uh, little desk, looks like you'd put books. The books are called deck logs. He's going to record all the changes in direction and speed and anything else that happened that was noteworthy. Finally, that space, that's called the auxiliary con. The captain, navigator, and others are going to relocate there. When they're doing that, which is depicted in that photo, that's called an underway replenishment. Just pretend it's a Saturday morning. The captain wants to fill her up. Gas station is in the middle. He swings the midway alongside. The gentlemen in there keep a constant distance, maintain the constant speed. Captain, first thing he does is going to send over a credit card. He's going to get some points today. He's going to get a lot of fuel. How about 750,000 gallons to fill her up? Ship had a big gas tank, 2.3 million gallons of diesel fuel, and another 1.2 million gallons for jet fuel. They'd be tied up for a while. They could receive about 12,000 gallons a minute. Uh, and they could also receive dry goods and munitions, etc. So it could be tied up for a couple hours at least. Last thing we see, we're going to exit down this uh, passageway and go down three ladders. As we do, though, someone said about the collisions. Well, the captain, generally it's his ship. He can go wherever he wants, right? But the officer of the deck had standing orders when to get the captain involved. If he's down on the hangar deck, he can't get involved to, to solve a small situation. So generally, he's going to be up here on the bridge or he could be in his... Uh, at sea cabin, which is right there. He could sleep, he could take meals, meetings, take a shower. Generally, he's up here so he can answer, uh, create, pro uh, solve problems so you don't read about him in the paper the next day. He does have a much larger cabin down below. His uh, in port cabin, that's where he can entertain dignitaries and make everyone happy. But generally, he's going to be up here. And one last thing to point out, we have the uh, Roosevelt uh, person here, the sailor, and this ship was the uh, ship uh, that was involved in the uh, Persian Gulf and the first Gulf War. The admiral that was embarked on board, he was in charge of all the carriers that were in the Persian Gulf, and that would have included at times up to four different carriers, and it included the Roosevelt across the way that the admiral on board this ship was in charge of. And uh, I've been on both, and this the accommodations here are not quite as stellar <laughs> as they are over there. <laughs> Thanks for coming, folks, and have a great day in the Midway. A lot more to see. Which way? Yeah. Look at the old TV. Look up. <laughs> Chief of staff. <laughs> <laughs> what? Her head or that? <laughs> okay. This is where they had all the important meeting rooms. A fake steak. I want that for dinner. Steak and potatoes. <laughs> just one cook by himself? Oh, it was just for him. No, it's for these people. For the meeting room. You want to sit in one of the chairs? What? I wonder if that's where Papa would have been. <laughs>
What is it? Mm-hmm. What did He's he do? Teletype. You should take a picture of it with your phone. You might know what room it is. I can call him. Mm -hmm. stops right here with me. At the end of the day, I'm responsible to the Admiral and ultimately our Commander-in-Chief for everything that takes place on this year. Or you can pay for me and Daddy pay for that. The captain's right next to the radio.
I said to get early.
$179 million of total revenue. The toll was completely eliminated. The booths were removed. It has been free ever since. That occurred in the early 1990s. Historically, we know that the local Indians, the Kumaye Indians, have been in this region for well over 10,000 years. They used to come out here also to Coronado to hunt and fish. There were no permanent settlements from them here because there was no fresh water in Coronado. In 1884, a couple guys moved to San Diego, one from the East Coast, one from the Midwest. Their names were Elisha Babcock and Hampton Story. They did not know each other when they moved to San Diego. They met here in Coronado hunting and fishing. They became good friends, used to come out here all the time together to hunt and fish. One day in the first part of 1885, they were sitting on the beach in the Pacific side of Coronado. One of them mentioned to the other, this would be an amazing place to build a resort hotel on the beach in a city surrounding it. The idea stuck with them. They went back and forth on how they could actually accomplish it. They ended up pooling their money together from their previous business interests, raising some investment money tracking down the last owner of record of Coronado, negotiating a purchase price and then buying it. All the land here in Coronado for $110,000. They now owned it all, but they did not have much money to move forward and do anything. Following what Alonzo Horton did, after forming a company named the Coronado Beach Company, they advertised all over the United States and Europe. In their ads, they talked about their future plans for a giant resort hotel on the beach, the city they were gonna build around it, the land that would be for sale at auction. They talked about the weather, the climate, the proximity to the ocean and the bay. They promised everyone that showed up to the first day of auction a free boat ride to get to Coronado and a free lunch while they were at the auction. That first day arrived and the Coronado Beach Company ended up serving 6,000 people lunch, but they did raise well over $110,000 the first day alone. The auction directly in front of us is the Pacific Ocean and the beach of Coronado. You know, this is the same view Juan Cabrillo would have seen back in 18. What was that? That was back in the 1850s when he first sailed his ship, the San Salvador, into the bay. Now, no wonder why he veered off to the right, found the opening of the bay, and uh, the rest is history here. The big Coronado Sandy Beach is consistently ranked one of the top ten beaches in the United States year after year. The Mr. Beach Report comes out the beginning of summer. This past summer, we were ranked number nine in the USA. By the way, the islands off to your right in the ocean there are the Coronado Islands. They're in Mexico waters. And check out all these sand dunes on your right. If you have dunes like this where you're from, I guess no big deal. Here, it is a big deal because they're not natural. They're all man-made, and they're most definitely not random. What you are looking at are giant letters, and the letters spell out the word Coronado across the beach. Look, there's the A to our right. If that is the A, that means the N will be coming up before it for Nado. This was done by a city worker named Mondo Moreno. They call it Mondo's Beach in his honor. If you ever want to see this, Google Earth, the Hotel Del Coronado. Look a little north in the sand, zoom in, and the word Coronado comes into focus in the Google Earth image. I head to our right, Hotel Del Coronado. Oh, opened up February 14, 1888. Came at a cost of one million. Over two million red tiles make up the roof structure here. Now, behind this fence here is that underground parking garage we talked about. You'll be able to sneak through little openings and see it. Three stories down, the water level is 10 feet below the surface. Big, big job here. Many movies filmed in this area. I got a clip of one filmed right here at the hotel. Let's see if you can guess who this is, maybe what the movie was. Well, who was 
that. And I didn't hear the movie. That was some like it hot. Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis. You know, in the movie, it takes place in Florida, but we know it actually was filmed right at the Hotel Del Coronado. Theater modeled after the one in England. A lot of 
Shakespeare and plays take place here all year long. It is a beautiful theater. We are coming into the plaza for the Museum of Man. Check out all the carvings on the front of the museum on your right. They all have something to do with the history of San Diego, all done by the Pecorelli <coughs> brothers. The Pecorelli brothers, not widely known by name, are also responsible for the seated figure and face of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. We're coming out onto the Carrillo Bridge. The Carrillo Bridge was the main entryway into Balboa Park for the 1915 Panama, California Exposition that was held here honoring the opening of the Panama Canal. Now that exposition is also why all those beautiful buildings that we just went through were built. They were built for that exposition. On my right across the canyon, you'll see the little aerial tramway. That is the San Diego International Zoo. The beautiful zoo in that canyon over there on the hillside. Coming into view ahead to our left, a park within the park. This is Wells Point Park, a three-acre off-leash dog park. The dogs get to run around free off their leash and this, these acres jumping, playing, sniffing, smelling, peeing wherever they want. They're all safely contained by fences that go all the way around the park. Look how, how fun they are in there playing around. And this big series of gates here on our left. Hopefully they remain closed. They're going in right now. Every now and then some joker props one open. Always bad. Always bad. General temperature for any city anywhere, I guess. Precipitation. They say we get about 10 inches a year in San Diego on average. Not bad. We're gonna, talk, we're gonna pause from the weather for just a sec because we're gonna do our very best impression of a San Francisco trolley. You know, I don't know how they deal with this in San Francisco day in and day out. And then just think if they drive a vehicle with a manual transmission, going up and having to stop at the red lights and stop signs and having some inconsiderate park right behind you. Yeah, that would get old really fast. Then factor in the fog they have to deal with. No, thank you. Folks, I'll stick with our horrible winter weather day like today, any day. And this is a winter day for us too. And spring and summer and fall. You're looking at my winter uniform. Yep. It changes in winter. It'll get a little bit cooler in the nights and evenings. You have to wear a jacket in the early mornings and a jacket at night. But sometimes, sometimes in San Diego, it gets super cold. It will get frigid here. It will sometimes at night drop down into the 40s. I know, we're spoiled. You know, what was that, about two months ago, about, I was talking about temperature on the tour, and this nice lady behind me said, Jeff, today it was minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit with the wind chill at my house. I'm like, what part of the Arctic do you live in? Minnesota. 31 degrees ambient, minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit ambient that day at her house. And there it amazed me, the guy on the same one, when she said that, he's like, yeah, I'm from Chicago, it's the same there, except I have to go home tomorrow because we have a big job, I have to lay concrete day after tomorrow. I'm like, concrete? How do you pour concrete when it's that cold? He's like, we do, you gotta do what you gotta do. If they change the chemical compound, they use electric blankets and stuff, but I can't even imagine being outside all wrapped up, bundled, much less working with something wet like concrete, but they, they do it. Amazing. We are coming into Little Italy. Little Italy is actually one of the... Little Italy is actually one of the larger Little Italy's in the United States. Said to be bigger in size than the Little Italy in New York City and San Francisco combined. Current rezoning for San Diego's Little Italy puts this at just over 60 square blocks of space. Pretty big. Heavily, heavily redeveloped over the past few decades. Every time you see something like that, that thing to our right there going up, that means a couple of the original homes the Italians settled in are disappeared. And they are disappearing. 
coming at an alarming rate here. Speaking of those Italians and Italian homes, they first start settling in this part of San Diego, coming Little Italy, in the mid 1870s into the early 1880s. It was even noted in a paper back in those times that said the Italians have arrived in San Diego, as noted by the fishing ship anchored in the bay. It did not say a whole lot more than that. Their numbers slowly grew until 1906. That year, their population grew, <laughs> grew a lot because that was the year the Russians continued on and off throughout 1885 and 1886. When complete, the Coronado Beach Company had raised well over $2.2 million in revenue. Earthquake and fires in San Francisco. Many of those early fishing families fled that carnage came down here to continue their livelihoods. Once they discovered the weather and the fishing here, they never moved back to San Francisco. Ahead to our right, all of those ships are part of the San Diego Maritime Museum, a floating history museum. They have submarines on display and sail ships, actually two subs, an ex-Navy submarine and a Cold War era Soviet submarine. And the brown one facing out here to your right is a near exact replica of the ship Juan Carrillo sailed into the bay in 1542. Only near exact because that has an engine they give tour on. There's the Navy sub here to your right. Uh, the old Cold War era Soviet sub hiding back here to our right behind this pirate looking ship. And then to our right is the Star of India. The Star of India is the oldest active ironclad sailing ship in the world. This ship was built back in 1863 or when Abraham Lincoln was still president. And I did say active. For once a year, they tow the Star of India out to the open ocean. They put up all its sails and they sail it around our coastal waters under its own sail power. It is quite the sight to see this ship out there sailing with all its sails up. And there is no engine aboard this one. When it is underway, it is all done by sails and wind. Admission into that Maritime Museum gets you on board all of their ships, including both submarines. You have to go down inside all of them.